afternoon, everyone. It's uh, 12 o'clock, so we'll start Medical Grand Rounds. Uh, today, we <clears throat> have two speakers. Jason Persoff is the first. He's an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Hospital Medicine. He uh, did his undergrad at the University of Colorado, <clears throat> where he graduated Phi Beta Kappa, and he won the Van Eck Award for excellent, Excellence in Education and Commitment to the Community. Went to medical school at the University of Colorado and did a residency and chief residency at the Mayo Clinic Jacksonville and joined the faculty there when he finished his training. While he was there, he won Teacher of the Year Award on three separate uh, occasions. Came back to Denver in 2012. His bio sketch identifies him as being a quote, internationally renowned storm chaser, appearing on the Weather Channel, the Discovery Channel and the Learning Channel. After chasing a tornado through Joplin, Missouri in 2011, he went to the Freeman Health System Emergency Room and was a hospitalist there for the first day on the first day of the disaster. And that experience uh, started his interest in the role of hospital medicine in responding to disasters. He's currently the assistant medical director of emergency preparedness at University Hospital. And uh, interestingly, his bio sketch also identifies him as being an erstwhile, uh, an erstwhile stand up comedian. So I'm not quite sure what to expect from the grand rounds. Nothing uh, good. Nothing good, right. <laughs> Doug Ornoff <clears throat> uh, is the second speaker. He did his undergrad MD and PhD in pharmacology at the University of North Carolina. Um, he won the John M. Alexander Medical Scholar Award for academic excellence and service to humanity and had four separate scholarships during his training period. Did his residency at the University of Colorado and now he's a hospitalist uh, in Denver. Uh, for questions uh, uh, from the audience, you can put them in the chat box or the Q&A, and uh, we'll get to them at the end. Uh, Jason, you're up. Thank you very much. Al. I pre really appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and get my screen going here. All right. Um, so uh, both Doug and I are very pleased to be here, and we're uh, grateful to uh, have a chance to do that. We'll be talking about the Joplin tornado, um, which was alluded to in, the, in our introduction as a touchstone for transforming emergency preparedness and in internal medicine, which is often emergency preparedness is thought to be a mostly emergency room, surgical and ICU related issue. And I think Doug and I will make the case that that's not the case. The tornado in pictured actually was Campo, Colorado, which is in Southeast Colorado on May 31st, 2010. That's not the Joplin tornado, um, but it's a cooler picture. So we went with that. Um, neither Doug or I have anything to disclose financially, um, but we're open to offers, uh, just so you know, we're here for you. By the end of this talk, our hope is that you guys will be able to understand how the Joplin tornado transformed not just my own journey and Doug's journey, but also how it transformed uh, the nationwide, we're, we're making an impact nationwide on uh, improving disaster response. You know, we'll go through the recognized deficiencies of disaster planning that affect hospitals. And I think the last one is very important. What is our individual role and what is our departmental role as it relates to incident command, something that's been brought into sharp focus with, uh, with COVID. Um, so to go ahead and start off, um, you know, I, I'd love to tell you about my storm chasing hobby. I really would. I just picked four of my favorite photos, um, but that's not really why we're talking today. Suffice to say that medicine and storm chasing are almost identical to me. They both have anatomy and physiology, and they both can be a little bit destructive. But all of that aside, the, um, they're very, very similar to me, and I'm very passionate about both of them. We're going to hone in instead on May 22nd, 2011. Um, on that particular day, uh, there was a potent weather system that would set up over the central third of the United States. My chase forecast brought us into the area of southeast Kansas into southwest Missouri, where there were a lot of different parameters coming together indicating a very high risk for tornadoes. On that particular day, the National Weather Service issued Tornado Watch 325 at 1.30 p.m. Um, tornado watches, um, just, as, uh, 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 just because most people still are not familiar with this, 
means the conditions are ripe for the potential for tornadoes. But destructive thunderstorms occur within tornado watches all the time. You'll notice that in this particular watch, Joplin is right dead center in the center of this particular tornado watch. You can also see one of the other frustrations which we encounter in storm chasing. We actually have to get to where the storms are long before they appear. Um, this is approximately 350 to 500 miles in diameter. And so we make our very forecast into very small areas for storm chasing. The National Weather Service in Norman has to put it together for the country. At 5.17 p.m., the National Weather Service issued a tornado warning for Joplin. And at 5.41, the first tornado touches down in the western Joplin outskirts. One of the frustrations as a storm chaser, as well as a physician, is the fact that the public, after this tornado touched down, continued to state that they had absolutely no idea and got no advanced warning of a tornado touching down. And in fact, the actions at the various hospitals showed that they also were not very sensitive to the potential destruction that day. Part of this has to do with sort of a saturation effect. We get lots of tornado watches and only very few tornado warnings. The key here was that at 515, there was a tornado warning for Joplin. Um, and they still had almost 50 minutes or 45 minutes uh, before the tornado would actually touch down into the main downtown area. So this is just a satellite view. Um, here's Southeast Kansas, obviously, and Joplin's right over here. There's a line of thunderstorms. What you can see is there's these two little white dots. They look really white and bright because the storms are rapidly developing. And within 15 minutes uh, to half an hour, they basically explode like nuclear bombs and have about the same amount of energy in the clouds themselves. So I'm gonna show you a video, a video now. Um, this is from uh, friends of mine who chase really dangerously, but do a great job of getting there. And the key on the Joplin tornado event that is really amazing is how the tornado went from 10 yards wide to three quarters of a mile wide in about 45 seconds. So um, what I'm gonna show you now is just how quickly this occurred. Um, I was on the back side of the storm, so actually couldn't see the tornado and didn't feel safe uh, chasing uh, in advance of the storm. So the tornado here is only a few yards in diameter. And you'll notice that it has several different vortices which are coming down. These vortices are no more than maybe 10 yards each. Normally when a tornado touches down, most tornadoes only last about seven minutes, by the way. Um, when a tornado touches down and begins to do destruction, typically it takes about a half an hour to grow in size. This tornado actually grew wider than, it, than the speed at which it was moving. So there were two factors that led to an incredible explosive development. One was that the storm itself was moving relatively rapidly, but the second was how very rapidly it went from a few tendrils to now you'll see in the next few seconds, the video is shaky, of course, because these things happen. It's as if the sky sets itself down upon the earth. So this tornado rapidly grew. And the reality is just because you can see a tornado does not mean that you are able to navigate around it or be safe around it because tornadoes can expand very rapidly. Many people in Denver feel that we're very safe, but forget that in 2008, there was an F5 tornado that crossed Northwest over I-25 in the town of Windsor, Colorado at 10 a.m. in May. All bizarre things, Northwest 10 a.m. F5. But this is very similar in how it appeared. And you can see that this tornado has gone very, very big and would go on to be about a mile wide very shortly thereafter. Now, to give context, this was a very big year. May 22nd, 2011, um, a month earlier in, on like April 28th, 2011, a similar tornado had touched down in Alabama. This is video which just shows how rapidly things can change. This was actually a fun video to watch because um, uh, of how this person who's videotaping reacts. First of all, this is also an F5 tornado. The tornado sca damage scale, by the way, is not based on how big or wide a tornado looks. It's based on the amount of destruction that occurs. So um, an F5 tornado is capable of scouring concrete and asphalt off the road. And these are EF5 tornadoes we're talking about. This one was interesting because it was moving so powerfully, it was generating further tornadoes which were circulating around the tornado. These are the horizontal bands you'll see. Now, most people at this point, including me, would not be sitting outside calmly videotaping, 
but I, 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 I'm proud of this guy. He moves just a little bit inside, just a little bit, and then says, nah, it's time to go back outside again. And so he does. And I want you to pay attention actually to the tree here. Uh, and he goes a little bit inside. This will keep him safe because now he's on the other side of glass. So anyway, watch the tree and notice the direction the wind is blowing. Um, it's blowing. The tree will continue to blow toward the tornado at all times. So the tornado is only about half a block away. And um, within seconds, uh, we see that the wind has shifted very dramatically. And you can see the, the trees bowing there. And it's about this point in time, now that the tornado's passed, that he says, OK, that's it. I'm, I'm out of here. Um, so just kind of a funny uh, thing. But again, it shows the power of these EF5 tornadoes. So the Joplin, this is Joplin, Missouri from the air, and what you're looking at is a damage map. The Joplin tornado followed a very similar path to major tornadoes, which is that they basically end up in a comma shape. Um, the tornado first touched down over here. The more red or yellow that you're looking at, the more serious structural damage that occurred. So you can see something very, which is very unusual um, for a tornado. Within seconds of forming, which is right here where there's mo moderate damage. By the way, green is moderate, not mild. Uh, moderate damage. You start seeing some reds as the tornado intensified. Here's what you, when you saw it get to three quarters of a mile wide. And then you can see the tornado. This whole damage path is the tornado. So if you can imagine overlaying this over, let's say, 225 and I-25, you can get an idea of the scale of what we're talking about here. The main impact of the tornado follows the red structural. And, and I want you to pay really close attention to this area right here, because this is where the hospitals were located. Now, Joplin only had two hospitals um, in its city limits. The next closest hospitals were in Tulsa, um, which is several hundred miles, which is about 150 miles away. This is a uh, Google map, which shows you that in the genius that comes from designing hospitals, one of the first cardinal rules is for, for emergency preparedness is you don't build the hospitals in the same location. Uh, and they didn't, actually. They moved them about 100 yards apart. So here is St. John's Medical Center up to the north and to the south is Freeman Heart Institute. The problem here is, as you could see from the tornado path, the damage path of this tornado actually hit both hospitals. To show you from the air first, this is the aerial view of St. John's Hospital. You can kind of see... Uh, the outlines here match up. This is before the tornado, and then this is about 30 seconds after the tornado hits. Now, admittedly, this was taken days later, but it gives you the idea of the destructive force of what happened. This was a fully well-built hospital, and it was very old, um, and basically it took off the top floor, which is the fifth floor, and part of the fourth floor of the hospital within seconds. And to really emphasize that, this is the inter internal view of uh, security footage from the waiting area. Now, a funny story about this is the even though there had been a tornado warning, it wasn't until a security guard went out to smoke a cigarette at around 545 that he saw the tornado coming on that he came in and announced what they call their condition gray. At that point in time, people were moved from the lobby, thank goodness, so that um, people could take shelter. Surgeons were still operating at that point in time. And the surgeons basically realizing that they were about to be hit, dove on top of the open bodies of these patients while the hospital itself was, was torn apart. Now, tornadoes cause their damage, not just from the wind, but from all the stuff that they kick up. In other words, if you look at the stuff that is cast airborne by a tornado, that is what does the damage. Now, the portion of St. John's has just been hit. The power is going to go out. And this is going to be the lobby in the next few seconds. And you can just basically see how everything is just swept to one side um, and the damage continues. By the way, I would own stock in whoever built the security camera because, man, kudos. Um, that thing kept going the whole time. So what did it look like in St. John's? Well, this is the inside. The, they had approximately five minutes between the announcement of the code gray, which was done by the security guard who was smoking a cigarette to get their patients uh, into safety. The same process that we use here when a tornado warning is issued is, is that we move patients to an interior hallway as much as able. And that, that really is important. 
because one of the things that happens structurally when a tornado, when tornadic winds hit a, a building is the winds accelerate because they're being squeezed in between floors. And so the goal is to get patients away from that and leave as much equipment behind as possible and close the door. Well, hospitals such as our third tower and AIP2 and AIP1 for that matter, generally have for the health of patients and well-being, and I'm personally very happy about this, have a ton of window space. But most hospitals don't build their hospitals with windows that can withstand EF5 tornado winds. Not only is it not economical to do so, the odds are against it, and most windows aren't going to hold up anyway. The first thing that happens is windows will blow on the leeward side and then blow through the building and toss the wind, the uh, the furniture, et cetera, to the other side of the building, everything becomes a weapon. And uh, IV poles, EKG monitors, everything went flying. Uh, the uh, equipment down here that I'm signaling in the left-hand uh, photo came from across the hallway. And that included the other door, some portions of the equipment, all of it became projectiles and caused injury to those patients who were there. So um, cell service for the entire town was down within minutes. Um, there were multiple fire stations that were destroyed within the path of the tornado. And basically in the five to 10 minutes it took for the tornado to go through the entire downtown Joplin area, 1,500 people were injured, trapped, or dying. And this all occurred within 10 minutes. To bring this home, here is a Google map photo of one street. And this is the after image of the exact same street. Here's that tree, that tree. Here's this tree, that tree. Um, you don't even see anything. And basically the entire area became unrecognizable to survivors. So this all happened in a very short period of time. 162 people died initially. Uh, there were an additional eight people who died later uh, from invasive mucor mycosis of the skin. 21 were killed at a nursing home. You can imagine how difficult it is to try and herd demented patients to stay in a particular room. 15 people were killed at St. John's Hospital, which included five nursing staff, most of them on the upper floor. One of the patients who I take care of later saw a Coke machine airborne, grab one of his nurses and knock them through the roof up into the air. One officer was killed in the line of duty and 23 people were killed, killed outside. Now, the 23 people who were killed outside is a notable figure. Remember how much warning they had. No one should have been outside at the time, and yet that happened. Now, a very interesting thing happened, sort of a miracle, if you will. Let's talk about Epic. So, on St. John's Hospital, normally a 500-bed hospital was only half filled with patients because that particular weekend, they were installing Epic on all of their floors. And so they reduced their population because they were transitioning from a health record because Epic has a, sl a slightly steep learning curve. It turns out that installation of Epic and CT Lynn will be happy about this actually saved lives. <laughs> so, you know, every now and again, Epic does something really great. So anyway, we move on. Patients from St. John's were evacuated to Freeman Hospital, which I showed you earlier was just south of St. John's. Um, that's where I ended up going. Um, I had been on the highway thinking I was dealing with tornado injuries there. Um, I have a background uh, in as an EMT paramedic and fire medic up in, in um, Boulder County. And so I started setting up a triage area on the highway where some cars had been knocked over by straight line winds. When we ran into a police officer who told us the hospital had been destroyed, there was only one other hospital and I knew where I needed to be. Freeman Health System, when we pulled up, had also been glanced by the tornado and their power station had been destroyed. Um, so they were on backup power. When backup power happens with an entire hospital, as I found out, it causes all of the fire alarm lights to flash. When my partner and I got in front of the hospital, he was also a physician, uh, to go into the emergency room to begin helping, the entire hospital had this very bizarre asynchronous set of flashing lights, which we could see through dark windows. And it really looked like a walking dead moment because it was dead silent. On the drive there, we saw people who, we saw one person off to the side who had, was getting out from underneath a dead cow. And we didn't have the chance to stop and help him. There was a massive influx of waiting room patients, uh, people who were arriving by personally owned vehicle, 
and, and roles and responsibilities were completely fluid. In fact, I actually now working in disaster can say that I was a rogue element by coming in. I showed up with my stethoscope and short, short sleeves and soaked and uh, identified myself as a physician and was allowed to operate as a physician in the hospital at the time. That's not how it's supposed to work, but it worked out okay. I promise I didn't hurt anybody. The biggest issue is who's in charge when this suddenly happens? Who do I report to and what are my responsibilities? Now, as, as Doug and I take you through this, it, you may say, well, COVID is a totally different experience than what we're talking about here. I mean, how often does this happen, a hospital being destroyed? Not often, but the same principles are in play. It was in that night after working 12 hours um, directly, uh, initially in the trauma bays, and then eventually they said, oh, you're a hospitalist. We have a whole bunch of patients coming over from the other hospital. Would you mind joining me and coming to our discharge lounge, which we're setting up as a makeshift area? So I went and they took me through the emergency room waiting room, and I thought that's where they were taking me. There were hundreds of people packed in. Uh, many were completely shell-shocked. There was blood and vomit everywhere. It was really horrific. And I thought if they put me in there, I would go insane. Fortunately, they put me in a room which ended up having 40 cots in it. And I ended up taking care of multiple patients that night. It was the best night of medicine I ever had in my entire life because I got to spend time with the patients talking to them. There was no medical record that I could refer to. And it allowed me to just practice medicine. Plus my documentation didn't need to, <laughs> to meet any criteria. And I got to tell you, it was in a wonderful night, but I also made a promise that night that I would improve disaster preparedness because I didn't know who I was answering to. I didn't know if anybody knew if my patients existed, um, like how are they getting registered? How are they getting meds? How are we going to get their families over here? And so that night was the night that I made the decision to transform my role. So briefly, I want you to be prepared for your family as well as this. And at the end, um, the rest of the presentation after this is going to be focused on systems level planning. But the question I have for you, are you prepared? What would you do in this situation for your division or department? How would you respond if suddenly the University of Colorado were destroyed? Uh, who do you report to? Where do you go? How do you pace your response? Remember, there's usually a ton of volunteers at the beginning of a disaster, but then somebody's got to take over for those volunteers. And where is that pool coming from? Does your own department or division have an optimized emergency plan, an organized one? I can already tell you the answer, but we'll move forward. Who is coordinating everything? And more importantly, what about your family? What if a tornado hit Colorado and you couldn't, you had no cell service, no ability to get in touch with them? Do they know where to go? Do they know how to find you or, um, you know, get in touch with you? So that's what this presentation is all about. So for you personally, I highly recommend you go to ready.gov. Uh, you'll see up in the upper bar, it says disasters and emergencies and make a plan. Those are two of the best ways to sit down with your family and make sure that you all have a good understanding of what to do should something similar to this happen. So Doug's gonna take over now and talk about uh, systems level things. And to do that, I thought an analogy was appropriate. So we're gonna go with this. This man right here is my great grandfather. He's the first cat herder in our family. Herding cats, don't let anybody tell you it's easy. Anybody can herd cattle. Holding together 10,000 half wild short hairs, well, that's another thing altogether. Being a cat herder is probably about the toughest thing I think I've ever done. I got this one this morning right here. And if you look at his face, it's it just ripped to shreds, you know? You see the movies, you, have, you hear the stories, it's, I'm living a dream. Not everyone can do what we do. I wouldn't do nothing else. It ain't an easy job, but when you bring a herd into town and you ain't lost a one of them, ain't a feeling like it in the world. Just a, this man just a great, uh, just a great Super Bowl commercial. So sorry, had to share that. All right, Doug, you're up, my man. Thanks, Jason. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, so. That really is a, uh, a, a fitting transition uh, because a lot of what Jason uh, describes and what he hints at in terms of system level uh, organization for response efforts 
um, really traces back to what a lot of people similarly experienced um, in the 1960s and early 70s uh, in a set of very devastating uh, wildfires in California. Uh, and this is important because uh, you know, the overall response uh, effort was characterized uh, by being very, very uncoordinated. Uh, there was a lot of confusion between who was supposed to be providing resources uh, you know, between the local, the state, federal levels. Uh, there was finding that different counties were having entirely different systems of response. There was very often no overall clear chain of command. And when there was, uh, it, there was often people that were reporting to several superiors at once uh, or assigned to widely disparate tasks. And so uh, the, the response uh, effort was judged as being that there needs to be a better system in place. Uh, and so what was developed progressively is something called the incident command system. And the system had progressive development through the early 2000s, um, but a real key milestone was the September 11th, 2000 attack, um, the aftermath of which led to what's called uh, the Homeland Security Presidential Directive 5. And that created a formal system for disaster management across the entire US. Uh, and this, this system is termed NIMS, N-I-M-S, the National Incident Management System. And that's important because it mandated that ICS, this, this uh, system of command setup, um, be what we are going to use for response to any and all disasters in the US, no matter where in the country the incident occurred, and no matter what kind of incident occurred. Uh, Jason, can you go to the next slide? Perfect. Uh, so the modern day ICS is important because the, the structure that it provides works to avoid the problems that are experienced in so many disaster response efforts. And so that command structure includes several key principles, uh, which uh, we'll briefly explore. Uh, first is that ICS establishes a hierarchical chain of command so that each person involved in the response has a superior who is very clearly designated and to whom they report. And that hierarchy uh, goes all the way up to a position who has overall authority called the incident commander. Next slide. So second uh, feature of ICS is that in this hierarchy, each person has only one direct superior. So it eliminates any overlap or confusion. The third aspect is called manageable span of control. And this is what's uh, meaning that each person should have a limited number of direct subordinates. Uh, the ideal number being anywhere between three and seven. Uh, with the intent that superiors aren't stretched too thin between uh, the subordinates that they are overseeing. The, uh, the next aspect uh, is that the highest levels of ICS command structure are organized into distinct modules that efficiently divide up the response effort into uh, a certain number of management sections. And that's uh, what is kind of outlined here. Uh, you can see the incident commander at the top, and then the, the basic breakdown always starts with there being what's called a command staff and a general staff. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, certain aspects of what each of these do, um, but uh, the, the most important part of there being this modular organization is actually what comes next, which is that the entire effort is flows from the top down, starting with the incident commander uh, and allowing them to kind of expand the command structure according to the scale of the disaster, the severity and the extent of that incident. So uh, what this basically means, for example, is that um, a, a very small disaster is gonna have only a small expansion of the overall ICS command structure, whereas a more complicated uh, type of incident 
you know, for example, the COVID pandemic, is going to involve a much larger hierarchy with the full expansion of all the available positions. And we'll see an example of how this plays out in a moment. Um, but a huge advantage of this kind of system is that it can be used in a, a quote unquote, all hazards approach, meaning that the overall command structure remains the same, whether the incident at hand is uh, a natural disaster, such as a wildfire, a technological disaster, such as a mass blackout, or a man-made incident, such as a terror attack. And the final key to why ICS is so effective is that it standardizes terminology and provides a path for clear and consistent communication. And so that is all uh, or orchestrated into uh, that slide that Jason uh, was just at, um, that national response framework. And that's what standardizes everything across the entire country for disaster response. All right, next slide. So if we were to compare and contrast how an organization like uh, University of Colorado Hospital might function in normal operations versus disaster operations run uh, under an ICS structure, uh, we would see, what we would see is that in normal ops, uh, we still have that hierarchy of authority, but it's not nearly as extensive or rigid. We'd see individuals often wearing many hats at once uh, with problem solving uh, occurring largely by a lateral flow of information uh, in a collaborative process. But if you contrast that with ICS, um, operations under an incident command system have a more rigid and expansive hierarchy. There's a top down flow of goals and more information is moving vertically. Uh, with collaborative efforts being limited, goals more concrete and short term, but with the overall benefit of added efficiency. And so a great example of this is the University of Colorado Hospital's effort at spinning up a virtual health platform um, at the start of the pandemic. Uh, so a, a virtual health platform had actually been in the works right as the pandemic began, but the time frame for that uh, for that to be implemented was over a period of like three or four years. Um, but because the uh, pandemic demanded it and the ICS structure was in place at the University of Colorado Hospital, um, leaders were able to make it a key priority uh, in a, you know, hey, this needs to happen and this needs to happen very fast. The rollout for uh, the virtual health platform was accelerated and it was completed in a matter of days. So under normal operations, something that would have was planned to take three or four years uh, to be completed was able to be implemented in a matter of days uh, in the pandemic because of the efficiency that the ICS structure brings about. So how does ICS relate to hospital operations during a disaster? Um, there's a couple of key bits of data that uh, are, are relevant to that. First is some data out of Israel, um, which found that most hospitals can absorb an extra 20% of normal volumes before uh, they start being overwhelmed. Um, the terminology that we use for you know, looking at overall resources uh, that are available to the hospital is stuff, staff, and space. Uh, you have to have stuff to treat the patients with, you have to staff, um, uh, use staff to treat those patients, and there has to be space available to house those patients. Um, and then when you kind of, when you take that and reflect on the fact that nowadays, uh, current trends for ER volumes and uh, the rate at which patients are boarded in the ED, um, hospital intake capacity, uh, the surge capacity, if you will, of, of hospitals in general is decreasing. Um, what ERs go for nowadays is that they want to be either completely full, nearly full, or at some times, um, you know, a little bit over full. Otherwise, the hospital is wasting money. And then the third bit uh, of data that has uh, that rel is relevant for hospital disaster operations is that there's no clear sign that extensive disaster education and training, uh, meaning like staff training, is helpful. And what this means is that the system has to be flexible enough to train in time and adapt in the moment. 
So the other way that ICS is really important um, is because a similar command structure called Hospital Incident Command, or HICS, exists for hospitals as part of the US's overall national uh, uh, response organization. So again, scalability is a key feature of HICS. And so what we, what we show right here, the diagram on the left uh, includes the full-scale operation currently in place uh, for University of Colorado Hospitals pandemic operations. And so I'd like you to note that because this is a sustained operation going over many months uh, with effects on the entire UC Health system, the full HICS command structure um, is rolled out. And matter of fact, what we've shown here, this very extensive uh, diagram is only for the operations branch. Um, there's uh, three or four other aspects of the general staff um, that head up the Hicks organization um, that are actually not expounded in this diagram. Um, now contrast that with something uh, like on the right, uh, what might happen at our hospital in the event of there being, let's say, a multi-car pileup on the highway um, and EMS is called and they report that we're going to be bringing 20, 30 patients um, into uh, to the UC Health ED uh, in a relatively short period of time. Uh, there is going to be a rollout of the uh, Hicks system, but it's not going to be nearly as extensive as what you see on the left. Um, so harkening back to the scalability of uh, the incident command structure and HICS um, and the use of a, a tailored model, how does internal medicine fit into all this? So if we use the example from the right side of the previous slide, you know, a multi-car pileup, there's 30 patients that are being brought um, in, a, in a very short window of time to uh, RED. Uh, how does internal medicine fit in? And so this is kind of the, the model that we envision. Um, and it's one where internal medicine, particularly hospital medicine in this case, uh, or in the case of this diagram, is, is playing a central role um, interacting with all of the other patient care hubs, intensive care, the emergency department, surgery, um, in this fashion that basically works to try and decompress the ED and temporarily augment the surge capacity for the hospital. And so this is through uh, things like collaborating with our surgical colleagues to take over direct management of uh, surgical patients uh, who are currently on the floor. Uh, it involves rapid transfer of relatively stable patients out of the intensive care unit, for example. And even as we do this, we're trying to expedite um, getting patients out of the hospital, um, be they just to kind of send them to uh, other hospitals nearby or even just rapidly discharge them home. And so we view our efforts as key to making HICS as comprehensive and effective as possible in a way that must include internal medicine and not rely on that traditional model that Jason hinted at earlier uh, in our presentation, um, which uh, that being you know, uh, intensive care, surgery, and emergency medicine, uh, largely to the exclusion of internal medicine. And so uh, an example, what we show here is a one-year period of all uh, UC Health disaster activations. And what you'll notice is that 50% of those activations were for situations that are managed primarily by internal medicine. And so to illustrate the power of having internal medicine formally in that structure, considering the following example of one of our interventions. Um, if, if, actually, Jason, can you go back one slide? So uh, you'll, you'll see the bottom two uh, uh, rows there both mention August 2018, uh, and it's significant because those are actually the same day. On the same day that there is this chlorine gas exposure, and we had, uh, the ED had already taken in uh, uh, rapidly 18 patients for that, later in the day we get word that there was a shooting just off campus um, and that a number of uh, patients are going to be rapidly hitting the ED uh, uh, in a polytrauma um, fashion. And so what we did is jumped in and took active role um, in trying to actually decompress the ED. 
And so this is data um, that looks at uh, the average number of admissions over the course of an entire year um, for each hour, uh, each set of four hours day by day. And then this purple arrow up top uh, shows the moment that we activated uh, our, our internal medicine response efforts and tried to rapidly decompress the ED with a rapid admission protocol. And what we were able to achieve is an immediate 15% increase in uh, ED bed availability. We increased our admission rate 83% above what we typically did uh, for that span uh, or that time span for the day. Uh, and when our ED colleagues responded, they said it was, it was tremendously helpful for them uh, because it gave them this sense of like cognitive unloading. They didn't have to worry about uh, the number of patients that they would normally have to. Um, and, you know, so as, as that being one example of our uh, intervention efforts, part of the other reason, or one of the other ways that we sought to be involved is in the hospital's JCO mandated biannual disaster preparedness drills. Uh, so uh, one example of this is uh, December 2018, uh, we did a tabletop simulation of a, uh, a situation where the hospital power goes completely out without uh, being able to be restored for a period of days. Uh, and that would require the evacuation of the entire hospital. And if you sit and think about that for a moment, it means that we had to simulate the evacuation, not of just all of our staff, not of all the visitors, but of every single patient that is currently housed in AIP one and two, we had to find a way to evacuate and transport them to a alternative medical facility. So that's the kind of uh, involvement that we seek to have and the kind of contributions that we seek to be able to make. Um, but of course the real proof of internal medicine's importance uh, lately has been how it's uh, uh, had a leadership role in the COVID response effort. And Jason played a, uh, Jason's played a huge role in that, and he's going to speak more about that right now. Thanks, Doug. So I'm going to come back to this slide that Doug had brought up earlier, and the, want again look at the the scalability. So Doug was just touching on how we downscale ICS, but we still use it, even if you're not aware of it. ICS is used whenever there is any disaster activation at the hospital. On the left, as he pointed out, is the operations branch of the incident command for COVID for just the hospital. And you can see that there's an extensive amount of people working in the background. Well, one of the problems that I was concerned about when I was in Joplin was, how does anybody who's working and taking care of patients know anything about what's going on here on the left? So one of the things that we created in the first spike of COVID cases was a position in the command center that works under operations and specifically with the medical staff branch director who is the chief medical officer, Dr. Jean Kuttner, or one of her colleagues uh, that she designates, uh, they operate under the operations chief and under the standard command staff. And this purple position here, the physician clinical support supervisor, was a position we created to help bridge the gap between command and the boots on the ground. And so basically what we found was over here on the left, are all these different questions, ideas, or whatever this is right here that people and staff had that needed clarity in an urgent fashion. On the other side, we have incident command, which includes a number of different criteria of you know, employee health, return to work, different messaging, and how to test in the incident commander. How do we bridge this gap? And that is where we created the physician clinical support supervisor to help get that all through one point of contact. Everything here could be funneled to the PCSS and vice versa, and, and two-way communication is supposed to happen. We learned a lot during the first part of the pandemic, and then we really codified it more for what is now turning out to be a disastrous spike in cases, as we're all aware. The first thing is the PCSS offers daily meetings with designated unit leaders, that is an incident command term, a unit leader from each department and division. Whether you are or are not aware of it right now, Every single division, be it surgical, medical, or any particular division, but whether inpatient or outpatient, gets an opportunity every day if they wish to participate with unit leaders uh, with the PCSS to bring their concerns to the fore and also to hear the latest about what incident command has to say. This allows tight coordination from both above and below via a single point of contact on each end, and it results in generations of 
daily reports. Some of you may have actually even seen these reports. They are encouraged to be uh, disseminated from their unit leaders, which summarizes the, the command issues of the day and the issues that were raised by unit leaders that need solving. And that is what we do in the PCSS and the command center. Now that brings us to the end of our talk. Um, I'll briefly state that the PCSS has turned out to be a very big success on the second spike and really has, I think, helped quiet rumors and give guidance uh, as well as solve many other problems. So I think Doug and I have made a compelling argument that internal medicine seeks to uh, be more involved in emergency preparedness and how that happens even on the micro and macro levels. So going back to our, our goals for the day, the first was to understand the transformational effect of the Joplin tornado and how that got us to where we are. For what it's worth, the PCSS has caught a lot of national attention and is being brought out in a number of different articles which have been published and are being published uh, to talk about that success and how vital that was in our disaster response. The second is that I think we all need to recognize that there are deficiencies in disaster planning that doesn't only affect hospitals, it also affects the individual. And one of the ways internal medicine, especially hospital medicine for hospital related issues can really work is to be embedded within the emergency preparedness structure. And there's not a lot of participation really from, from internal medicine in this regard. And the last is formulating your own individual roles and their departments as it relates to incident command. So one of my goals, once we get after COVID is to go through each department and division and to sit down and help formulate disaster plans so that we don't run into the position that I ran into in Joplin, which is not knowing who to go to, not knowing what to do in a situation like that. That would be better codified. And if we'd had a PCSS, we would have known where do we send a volunteer who comes running in with a stethoscope around his neck, start taking care of, you know, 80 patients. Um, but um, uh, this is the transformation that I felt uh, the Joplin tornado provided me. I've enjoyed having Doug on the journey and we hope you've enjoyed our talk. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> that, that was uh, t terrific. Uh, one of our uh, audience said that that your talks blew us away. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I love uh, it. That's yeah, enough punishment for the day, that, I think. Yes. So uh, first question is, um, what you've described is very much hospital based. And COVID is affecting the entire country, multiple hospitals, multiple cities. Um, how does this link up or how does this structure link up with um, an overall response uh, uh, at Swedish and Denver Health and the VA and the governor's office and on and on and on? It's a great question. So one of the things that's really amazing about Hicks and Doug really talked about this is, again, you may not be aware of this, but there are different regions of the state which uh, our hospital, uh, Denver Health, Swedish, all the hospitals listed there are part of the north central region of Colorado. And there are multiple regions in Colorado, I think a total of six. Um, and the, basically those regions have their own incident commanders, which um, oversee the overall response, not only from the hospital standpoint, but also uh, in the public sector. So each city and county has its own incident commander, all of that goes under what's called unified command, which is a joint shared command um, that sets the goals for everybody else as well. So the, the long and short of it is ICS continues to scale upward. And in fact, the governor is the incident commander for the state of Colorado. And so, um, and, and he is actively setting goals that public health then sends down that then trickles down through the various areas. So for example, Tri-County Public Health um, and, the, and Adams <clears throat> is sort of the overseer for Adams County and our hospital um, works with Denver Public Health to set these goals. The beauty of Instant Command is everyone knows what their role is, particularly the higher up you go on the chain. And it, it's very well integrated. So you'd be surprised at how integrated it actually is. Another, <clears throat> excuse me, another, another question from the audience is, uh, you've talked about uh, response with regard to material things, bed space. What happens if, the, uh, if there's not enough people to deliver care? How does this structure help with um, uh, responding to that problem? 
Uh, and that's a loaded question because that's what's happening exactly. right now. Exactly. So let me give you uh, some insight into that. At the state level right now, uh, being discussed as we speak, are uh, sort of a load leveling process looking at how do we maybe do what's called reverse triage, where instead of normally you have a patient who's out in the rural plains that needs to get tertiary or quaternary care, we take patients who are stable in our hospitals and decompress to these more rural areas to try and decrease the population, for example. Um, that's called reverse triage, and that's something that's being looked at. How do we look at moving staff around? So at the state level, are all areas being affected equally? Now, the problem with pandemics is the general answer is yes, but in reality, it's really right now the Western region where Grand Junction is and the Southern region are actually in worse shape than we are here in the Tri-County Health Area. How could you develop mutual aid contracts which allow workers to be shifted from one location to another? So those are things that are being looked at. But we are no doubt in a crisis. I think the unfortunate reality is everybody is wanting to get everybody else to help them. And um, that's something that we're coming up with creative solutions. I know that my group, the hospital medicine group is right now looking at how do we continue to deliver uh, excellent care to a rapidly expanding hospital population with the same number of providers, often internal volunteers, maybe getting external people involved. The solutions actually are being looked at, but um, I don't think the world has ever seen anything like this. So it's much more difficult. If it were a much more localized response, like a tornado hitting downtown Denver, wouldn't be a problem. We just move staff up from other parts of the state. And, and I'll, I'll add one thing, just having recently gone through the process of uh, getting my full state medical license. Um, there's actually been uh, some efforts at expediting um, that application process. And at the same time, uh, allowing uh, physicians who have recently retired or for whom their license has recently expired to kind of re-enter the workforce in a very limited fashion. Uh, but it, it gets exactly to that, that question of staffing. Um, and, and the other thing that I'll add is, you know, Jason mentioned earlier about how uh, at the beginning of a disaster is very often when you see this, you know, not spike not only in the number of cases, but the number of volunteers. Um, but that rapidly drops off uh, as you further out from the onset of the incident that you get. And so part of, uh, you know, disaster operations and disaster management is people management, uh, not just, uh, you know, who to, who to send where, but how do you spread out your staff over both space and time? Um, <clears throat> another question that comes from the audience is uh, back to the tornado question. Is there a tornado alley in Denver? Yes. Yes, there is actually. Denver's on the western fringe of the classic severe tornado alley, which starts around Lyman, Colorado. But Denver, and in particular the airport, is right in the center of a geographic uh, feature called the Denver Convergence Vorticity Zone, or DZVZ. The DZVZ is, an, it, it turns out Denver sits in a bowl. Um, so we talk about the Mile High City, but it turns out that areas like around Lyman are about a thousand feet higher than Denver. So Denver is actually in a depression and winds will circulate in that depression and then occasionally get entrained into the developing thunderstorms, creating less powerful tornadoes called land spouts. Land spouts still do tornadic damage and they are tornadoes, but there's a lot of reasons they're different. In fact, tornadoes have, by this mechanism, touched down uh, back in 1987. Um, there were five tornadoes that touched down, actually hit several of the hospitals, uh, glancing blows. Um, we've had uh, tornadoes touch down actually right next to the campus that were land spout type, very short lived and not very powerful. But the, the, we are considered in Tornado Alley here in Denver. Yeah, I've heard uh, Sixth Avenue and Montview uh, Boulevard both considered to be quote Tornado Alleys. Oh yeah, that's been hit a bazillion times. And uh, another really fun fact on every single country in the world, except for Antarctica, not really a country, more of a continent, but um, there have been tornadoes and tornadoes don't respect uh, boundaries. Um, Pikes Peak has about one to two tornadoes a year that hit it. Um, South Park is routinely hit, which fits the 
series really well. Um, but uh, mountain peaks get hit by tornadoes. They just don't make a sound. So most people don't know they exist. There is no safe place right. from a tornado. OK, well, we have uh, no more questions, but those were uh, terrific presentations and a very topical uh, discussion for what's going on right now. So thank you both very much. Our pleasure.